Hey guys, welcome back to another another podcast with my cohort Nathan Lemer. We are officially changing the name of the podcast. Uh, if you watched the first couple of episodes, we were uh, the Lemer and Pie Happy Hour, uh, and we are now reclaiming my time because the people Nathan have spoken. Yes, uh, great to be on reclaiming my time uh, with you, Jason. Um, as you know, I've long wanted to do a show called Reclaiming My Time, and. And uh, this week we made it happen by overwhelming um, uh, a vote on on Twitter. I think all 14 people who who submitted their votes overwhelmingly chose reclaiming my time versus some of the other options that are out there. And you know, it's funny. I, I knew a few people actually listened to our show because they said, "Yeah, happy hour among two middle aged men is just not cool." I you know I uh, fine. I, I that's that's fair. <laughs> But we, we have to go back and recount the votes and file lawsuits in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Michigan, and um, where else? <laughs> what was the other state? There was a pro- allegedly problems. <laughs> this vote was on Twitter. You can't possibly rig votes on Twitter. It's not like I have like five fake accounts that I use to vote artificially to encourage, you know, one particular outcome. I, I have no idea how that could have possibly happened. <laughs> He's, I, well, I I know of some people who have created many many accounts who I would imagine have probably rigged that vote in favor of uh, in favor of reclaiming my time. But yes, one of my goals for this weekend, by the way, is to sit down and actually create us a a, a a quick intro video of members of Congress featuring Jerry Nadler saying the words "reclaiming my time" during committee hearings. That that would be uh, that's what, something I'm going to try to put together. But my video skills, as as folks know who have watched the podcast so far, are not that great. iMovie iMovie is not my friend. Uh, so <laughs> shout out to the dozens of people who are still trudging <laughs> along this, this, this uh, metamorphosis of a podcast from the happy hour to now reclaiming my time. RMT. It's a good, it's a good podcast. I'm excited to see where <laughs> we go from here. RMT shout out to the dozens, the dozens of people. You sound like my old roommate. Cause um, one of my old coworkers at freedom works, he and I, I lived with him for about six months and I accidentally left my light on one day in my room. And he said, Jason, I'm furious with you for wasting tens of cents of electricity. <laughs> so, so thank you for the, to the dozens of people who are still watching the podcast or listening to the podcast on iTunes. Well, the original name did outlast near a Tandon's nomination. And <laughs> I, I got, you know, shout out to her, to those who, who may not know, we're, we're breaking news tonight, uh, Tuesday night, March 2nd, near a Tandon, everyone's favorite uh, Twitter hack who likes to fight interns on Twitter at two o'clock in the morning and abuser of journalists. Um, she is no longer going to be uh, up for confirmation of OMB director because because she's not good at managing and she's not good at taking care of the budget because unlike us who refuse to take any foreign money, she takes a lot of foreign money from, from adversarial countries um, and pushes her agenda at the behest of, 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 of her overlords. We don't do that. Why? Because we're, we're reclaiming my time. This is about uh, what we care about and you know, we're not bought and paid for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I, the, the death, the death kneel was Joe Manchin. And then adding insult to injury was uh, was Mitt Romney, then Susan Collins. <laughs> and the, it's like if you can't get Romney and you can't get Collins and you lose Mansion, you're done. Like you're just done. Credit though to Murkowski, who was very openly saying, "Well, you know, there are some things that the Biden administration is doing in Alaska." I would love to see some of those things changed. And maybe, you know, if, if they change those things, I might be willing to vote for her. Like, so blatantly sharing, <laughs> I'm, I'm up for sale. Let's see what we can do. And you know what? I don't hold that against her. I think that's actually kind of a smart tactic, particularly if you're a Republican and your, your state, you're trying to figure out, you know, what are the policies that are happening? What's happening at the federal level? And how can you use the various levers of power to, to move things in your direction? And honestly, like, nominations is a place where you can, you know, do some horse trading. And, and I think that, uh, you know, I think she made her statement clear and, and I think the Biden administration wasn't going to play ball and, you know, probably rightly pick someone who is better on Twitter than she is on um, uh, any federal payroll. So that that's a good win for the American public. Yeah. And Murkowski also, she's in cycle as well. She's up in 2022. So I'm sure the horse trading uh, was, was trying to do some good for her state. Uh, but, you know, Tandon, Tandon is done. Thank, thank, thank the Lord above. If he is there, thank the Lord above. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, we, you and I, I guess, you know, I didn't really watch much of the news this weekend because I was coming up to DC uh, and kind of just disconnected over the weekend, which means I spent no time in front of a TV and no, therefore no time watching C-SPAN to see what the hell was happening at CPAC. 
Um, you and I, I think are in, in uh, places in our professional lives where we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> right. So, you know, uh, CPAC was, uh, CPAC, I think for me was probably at its peak in 2011 when the libertarians took over, you know, uh, because that was, that was still when they were the got over near Cleveland park and, um, Oh God, right near the zoo. I can't think of the yes. neighborhood. Adams yeah, Oregon, yeah, yeah, yeah. Between Adams, yep. Oregon and Cleveland park. <clears throat> and that was, that was the pinnacle of CPAC. Rand Paul, Ron Paul, uh, Gary Johnson was there. Um, the libertarians were out in full force. Um, uh, and then the next year, the, the, the social conservatives made a comeback with Mike Huckabee being like, you know, uh, a, a notable name, others being notable names and libertarians. They were try actively trying to push libertarians out. Um, but I did not miss, I did not miss not going to CPAC this year. You know, how do I say this? CPAC actually is fun and it's not fun in my mind for the convention. It's not fun, uh, sitting through listening speakers. It is the one time a year where literally every conservative politico is together. We get together. We don't actually go to the event. We sit outside at the bar in national Harbor and we hang out. We drink, um, we tell stories, uh, we play poker up in the penthouse suite up at the Gaylord in, 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 in uh, National Harbor when it was there. Again, you're talking about when it was at Cleveland Park. They moved it to National Harbor, which is across the river from Washington, D.C. It's yeah. this kind of like fake resort um, that's like near the city. But also now that the, uh, the uh, casino is open, yeah. can, can actually become a fun time. Um, and again, like all the politicos, all the you know operatives, all the campaign staffers, all the kind of like reporters and influencers and the people you see on Twitter. So maybe you don't want to go, uh, but like all these guys get together and we just have a good time. I mean, last year, you and I, Kevin yep. Glass, Will Reinhardt are just like, you know, throwing back pints, having a great time. Oh my that God. to me is fun. That, that to was me a, is a fun time. horrible mistake. Cause I remember I picked up the tab for the, the bar that night. Three hundred dollars <laughs> later, because <laughs> I was I had been drinking since like four o'clock, and because right. uh, I was hanging out with um, uh, I was God, who was I hanging out with? I was hanging out with my buddy Brett Tolman, uh, former federal prosecutor, active in criminal justice reform, Lindsey Fifield from Heritage, uh, Chaz Creamy, and then like more and more people we know started to show up. You showed up, Kevin showed up, Will was there uh um god who else who else do i remember from that uh, that night in the vague roger stone stopped by did he no okay just, just run out there <laughs> so, i was like, actually so so i was actually at a party at cpac two years ago that roger stone was at this is the thing funny. about this event like like the who's who of fox news newsmax conserve twitter tcot hashtag tcot if you have ever T used that hashtag you show up at this thing and i have so many of these fun stories again not from the panels not from like meeting the activists i don't really care about that i don't talk about the the the, the hall where everyone's at you know i'll let matt schlapp and the guys at acu run that for me it is just a neat time to see people cut loose a little bit and chat and, and honestly like i cpac was in florida this year i wasn't gonna go down to florida for that it wasn't worth it to me and unless it's like five minute drive from my house i'm not right. actually gonna go to right. it right. but like that was the thing i look forward to about next year is we will all make fun of cpac we will all talk about it but at the end of the day we'll all end up there and have a great time because it's us spending money on our boss's dime thank you zach and and just catching up with reporters and people and actually cpac 2020 was the last time that was the last time i think i saw you in person i think it was and because that was because we were remember we were acting we were making jokes because we were up we were hanging so tpa taxpayer yes. protection alliance and freedom works went halfsies on a or maybe not halfsies but we, we split a, a, a hospitality a suite. suite right yeah and so i think most of us it was you me will upton zach the tpa crowd just random people who kept who show up and like hang out with us we spent most of our time in there when we weren't down at the bar we right. were, or doing a, you know, a, a, a meet and greet or whatever the hell, it, whatever the hell they were, like what was going on, like the private events that we had, things right. like that. We were, we were in that suite and we were making jokes at the time, like that somebody here has COVID. Yes. Like, yeah. Somebody, and someone ended up did. Someone did. I remember, saw, no, that weekend. No, like I remember that weekend. Um, so I went back home to Atlanta after spending the weekend in DC and then in, in part of the next week in DC and I went home to Atlanta and I was home for a week that day, but I did a family reunion with my mom and like her side of the family. And, um, 
we were talking about like how bad it could get. And I was like, look, it's going to get really bad. At, you know, it may not be immediate, but it's going to get really bad at some point. And I remember talking to a Washington Post reporter who was at one of the happy hours I was at at CPAC. And she's like, they didn't like, it was the way CPAC presented the information to everyone. It's like the vice president is fine. Don't worry. The vice president is fine. This person had yes. contact with the vice president, but the vice president has tested negative. He's fine or whatever. And like, he's not showing any symptoms. It's like, what about the rest of us? Yeah, that's right. So for everyone to recap, there was one person, I think a doctor from New York and New Jersey who had it. Um, and he was like one that like, like probably like, 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 you know, COVID patient zero in the world that I lived in. And so again, CPAC has tens of thousands of people there yeah. and COVID is just starting. You're hearing stories about it in Washington. You're hearing about it in, in, in Seattle and in California. Um, you're hearing about it in obviously, you know, Wuhan, although we would never refer to it as the Wuhan flu, that would be a terrible idea, but like, you know, hearing stories about it from, from, from overseas or in Europe. Um, I was actually scheduled to go to a trip to Europe that got canceled, um, yep. uh, because of of covid so it was like the same first here. story yeah, on here. the eastern seaboard we're like oh this is really a thing and it was like this gallows humor everywhere and it ends up being the last public event i went to in a pre-covid world that put you know you know quotation marks because it wasn't pre-covid but we felt like it was and i i remember like getting an email a couple of days later from my team saying don't go to work. You guys yep. stay home. And I was like, I went in the office, I think like a week later, picked up my stuff. And, and I don't think I've been back um, since. Um, and we're working from home and that's great. But, but um, uh, uh, that mo that was a weird couple 24 hours where they're like, the president's <clears throat> fine. The rest of you are not. And I remember putting it out on Twitter being like, this is awkward. Like, yeah. what do I do with this information? <laughs> right. No, I remember. So I remember because I, I mentioned the family reunion. I was at home the next week. And I was supposed to go back up. I was supposed to have a week at home. I think it was a recess week for Congress because this is back when I was coming up to DC, like, right. like 38 to 40 weeks out of the year and uh, commuting back and forth from Atlanta, but flying, not driving. And I remember, so they basically started doing the protocols. We had the senior staff at Freedom Works had already discussed this to some degree. Like we were going to start implementing some protocols. The question was, when do we pull the trigger on it? And then the, the number of cases started to tick upwards and it, people were starting to say, this is actually going to get pretty serious. Right. Uh, I think, cause I think by the time CPAC started the doc, first documented cases from uh, in the United States, starting with Seattle had been around for about a month, roughly give or take a few days. And basically the email, I got the email like the Thursday or so that I was before I was supposed to come up that like, don't come up next week. We're shutting down the office um, until further notice. And the, sh the, sh the crappy thing was that I had tickets to go see the Get Up Kids in D.C. That's this. It was like the Saturday before, like the, our lockdown began. Right. And of course, they canceled the tour anyway. So like right before that show, they canceled the tour. It was done. It was over with. So we didn't have we, you know, we got the tickets refunded, all that stuff. But it's just like, you know, here we are. I mean, we're. Next week is a year, I think, roughly, or right. week after is a year. Right. Um, so, and we've been basically in a state of, you know, lockdown to to lesser degrees to some more serious, more serious degrees. But, you know, I'm I'm starting a new job this week. I'm in the office. I'm wearing a mask because we're abiding by protocol. Are you excited about your job? What is your job? We'll take a CPAC break to talk about your new job. Are you excited? <laughs> well, I have something with CPAC I do want to discuss that really yes, that really will. that will really sickened to me. That. Yes. Um, no, I'm really, really enjoying my new job. I started this week at the Due Process Institute, which is a, a, a 501c4 uh, based here. In, uh, well, I'm in Reston, Virginia right now, but based in Washington, D.C. that focuses on criminal justice reform and um, uh, over criminalization and civil liberties issues like fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth amendment, uh, sometimes ninth, sometimes 10th amendment issues. And um it's been it's been really fun so far. It's 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 nice to be in a more focused issue set, working on things I really truly care about. These are not the only issues I care about, obviously, but like these are issues I really do have gotten very passionate about over the right. years. From you know days working on the Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act when you were still at our street, and then because we worked on that together when you were at our street, and then um, you know the First Step Act uh, in 2017 2018. Um, it, it was a fun set of issues and looking back on my life, my life could have turned out very differently from losing a father at the age of 12. I could have, mm. and I didn't run with exactly the, the best crowd in the world. Right. So, you know, it's, um, I, I, I care, I care about these issues a lot and I'm really glad to get working on them, but 
Back to CPAC. Yeah, back to CPAC. Where everyone should be in jail. Let's be real. <laughs> I remember, I can't remember what day it was. Maybe it was Friday morning when I woke up. And I saw the tweet of them wheeling in the golden Trump. The golden Trump. And it's just, I, I tweeted it out because it's like, it, like, isn't there a story in the book of Exodus about this? Where, where Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments in his in his arms, and Aaron had his brother Aaron had just had just helped the Israelites erect a uh, golden calf. Yeah, made and, out of all of the the golden bracelets and jewelry from Egypt. Yes, they made a golden calf and they were worshiping it. What the hell, man? <laughs> it's just like this. It was too. It was too good not to say anything about. Like the comparison was just too good not to make. But it, it's. Like that's the, ultimately that's the reason um, it was real tough to go to CPAC last year because of that. But like you mentioned, none of us go to the, the, the speeches or anything like that anyway, or the panel discussions. If we had gone to the speeches this year, we would have seen this viral video of this kid wearing obviously a suit dancing to YMCA in the most like emotive way possible. Um, so bad. <laughs> He's very white. Um, he's a young white kid, and uh, and and he is dancing and really, really like it is like it's like literally listening to a Ben Folds concert. It is like the like white boy from the suburbs rocking really in the rocking, suburbs, rocking, rocking out here, man. <laughs> um, I'll be honest. Um, I've already marked him on my list of never given an internship to. I love the energy, but dude, like YMCA, come on, it's not nineteen seventy seven anymore. Come on, man. No, it's just I was watching that. It's like. First of all, I didn't see a person of color in the entire video that they showed, and, which is not much diversity this year. Not, not, much, not diversity. much diversity this year. Not much diversity this year, and and then it's just also like this this like the the epitome of the white person. <laughs> yeah, like, oh. and and I think what's I think the mistake though that people should have made. I think actually we can go back to 2011, 2012, and even to be honest, 2013, 2014 uh, days. People can, can, and reporters do, journalists do, it's, it, it's turned into a big thing. And CPAC d- generates a lot of co- communications attention, a lot yep. of media attention. And, you know, uh, 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 it, it's a snapshot in time. It is, it, is a, it is a picture of a poll three or four years before an election. In 2012, 2013, you know, uh, Trump was not giving speeches. He gave a speech in 2011, and yep. no one really thought he, he was going to do anything from there. Um, much in the same way, this way, it's a reflection of where the party grassroots is in that moment. And it right. actually has no idea where it's going to be. I mean, I remember in 2013 running a campaign against the war on youth for generation opportunity, which I was like I talking that. about ending spending. That was our campaign. Have, is there a member of Congress or any conservative movement that cares about spending right now, you know, when you think about some of these issues that are, you know, the main focus or what you th- we think people are going to run on the golden calf of Trump or, you know, YMCA songs or, or spending, those are never the issues that really generate. And so it's fascinating. It's an interesting snapshot, but it really isn't any picture of what we're going to see in 2022 or, or 2024. No, and, and and by the way, for those of you who hear your background noise, um, uh, the people I live with uh, have pets, and uh, the cat is currently running around upstairs, and I hear him getting into stuff. Um, so I apologize for the background noise, but uh, the this the, the, the you just hit on something that's that's been on my mind. It's it's the what are the issues the conservative movement is really lining up behind, and what are they talking about these days? And you know, CPAC usually used to present a platform to talk about those issues. For Rand Paul, it was always spending it was always civil liberties issues he would talk about those uh you know um and in 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 some recent years even you know criminal justice because they had van jones and pat nolan together on a panel right right issues uh and remember the the one particular panel i think it was it was pat nolan van jones and um uh david clark the sheriff from milwaukee yeah yeah Yeah. maybe maybe van wasn't part of that one i know van was at cpac in the last couple years talking about criminal justice but but like Nobody, the, the, there are no big, they're not really pushing any big ideas or big pack, big, big legislative packages right now. I mean, of course they can't because they don't have the minority or majority in either chamber, but they haven't lined up behind one single set of issues that you're like, you know what? I can get behind that. At least say what you want about Newt Gingrich. Right. At least he gave the contract with America. Which yeah, it yeah. was, it was something Republicans could line up and run on in 19, in the 1994 midterms. And you know what? It was successful, but, and 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, so I'm not like the biggest fan of Kevin McCarthy anyway, but what, like, what is Kevin McCarthy's legislative agenda? He doesn't really seem to have one. It's just like, we oppose HR1. Cool, I do too, but why do you, like, what is your alternative? I know, you know, I know the Republican Study Committee has something, but it's not, it's, but it's just, you know, Republicans don't really have any credibility on those issues right now. And, and you know, I think any time we get together, we could have a conversation about the political realignment of the right and kind yeah. of what that means. I think there's a real identity crisis uh, about what it means. You know, are we post-Trump? Who is po- what is Trump's role within the party? What's the ideology we're doing? I saw Russ Voigt, who ran OMB under Trump, um, you know, far better than Neera Tannen, for the record. Um, you know, he started a new think tank, um, and it's really kind of like taking the intellectual ideas of, of Trumpism and the conservative movement. I'm really fascinated to see what, what comes out of that, if if anything comes out of it. And, and on that note, I'm just going to, you know, detour from where, where we were going, because there's a podcast we can. <laughs> and, and I'm actually going to, there's an interesting article I want to draw your attention to. We don't need to talk about, but I want to draw your attention to from the author of Slate Star Co- Codex, uh, uh, who was uh, recently named by New York Times, and he was trying to be a not pseudo anonymous. He has a new Substack called Astral Co- Codex Ten, um, and he had a recent podcast uh, article called "A Modest Proposal for Republican." Use the word class, and he had this kind of interesting idea about how reclaiming the concept of class, not in a Marxist framing, but actually in a framing about what is good for working class people. What, how, what, what about the market can actually benefit more people and allow upward mobility? How can you rethink the future of technology, innovation, um, trade and tax policy, healthcare policy? And I, to be frank, um, there, we should actually dive into this at some point yeah, and, sure. and, and chat about it uh, because I, I find it a really compelling um, idea from a guy who is not conservative, not Republican, not libertarian, a rationalist from uh, California who is very not political, writing this kind of perspective from a voter who has some interesting thoughts about how the Republicans could rebrand. And I, and I think, unfortunately, CPAC isn't there yet. Maybe next no. year it will be that. Maybe in the next six months or seven months, we'll have some other events. I know uh, Eric Erickson has the Resurgent Conference. I know there's some other events that come up. Hopefully some people can look at some of these proposals from you know, Sagar and Jetty and his realignment podcast project, uh, the Astral Codex uh, article, and some other works and say, hey, what do we actually believe in? Where, where do we go from here? Um, but you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, 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 CPAC in 2021 was not doing that. Uh, but again, that may not be their job, and, and they seem to get the media attention that they wanted uh, this year. No, I mean, you're, you're right. And, and I, you know, my last bit about the CPAC stuff, I mean, because you mentioned federal spending and just nobody's really talking about that right now. And it's always been an issue I care passionately about. And it just would be really nice to see Republicans actually proposing solutions, not just on that, but on any number of issues. But they're, it's just, they're so focused. And I, I get it. You're the minority. You, it's your job to say no. But like, but we always had, I've always had a rule with people it's like if you're going to come come to come to me with uh, to bitch about something you better have a right. solution in tow because it's one thing to complain it's another th- it, it takes a lot more energy and it, it takes a lot more to pr- provide a solution that can fix the problem i don't want to hear you complain about the problem what's your solution to fix the problem and republicans have not done that and they're they they're not they don't seem willing to do to to do that at all and that's 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 exceedingly frustrating but one thing going back to what you just mentioned about that 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 story, uh, or about the guy with the Substack. I mean, we're, this is something I was talking about with some other folks recently. It's it's we as free marketers, fiscal conservatives, whatever you want to call it, call us classical liberals, whatever the case may be. Like we have we suck at talking about the things we believe in and how they're beneficial to people. Whether mm, it's mm. whether it's how the market benefits people, whether you know. Uh, talking about the benefits of free trade, you know, people say, well, the middle class is shrinking. Yeah, well, you know, there is some truth to that. But the thing is, they're all moving to the upper middle class. Right. You know, not there are a few people who are who are falling behind. Yes, COVID did make that substantially worse. I'm not trying to dismiss that. But more people are going into the upper middle class and, and rather than falling down or they're not staying, they're not staying at this this level of just being being in the middle class they're moving up and we we've, we've got to communicate those success stories better and we're just not doing it we're not doing it good enough we we suck at telling our side of the story 
No, totally. Uh, the one area that we do well telling our side of the story is actually on some of these uh, more complicated issues, the issues that don't get the headlines. And I think two examples of that um, are, are actually, you mentioned earlier, but like the, the fact that Pat Nolan and David Safavian and others have been leading on criminal justice reform and using CPAC as an opportunity to educate grassroots activists who never would have thought of themselves as supporters of criminal justice reform. That's an issue where they have it. You've seen this more uh, a humble foreign policy being yeah. discussed by many people at places like that. Those are issues that, that you never saw our side having. And maybe we came at it from different reasons than you and I are uh, different presuppositions. But, you know, I think I think those are the areas that we can draw attention. So, you know, I, I'm hopeful that that, uh, you know, for all of the, the 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 headlines that that are generated and and and, and blue check marks scoffing at, at CPAC or other conservative events, I actually hope they continue because um, a they're fun for us to joke about, but also we all go to them. But then also sure. like it it is neat to see younger generations of people getting interested in this. We both know have so many staffers that worked for us and who we worked for who we met or gained con knowledge of through CPAC um, and other like, like 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 similar events. And and to be honest, I have like the best story ever that came out of CPAC and I, and I got to tell it because Go it's ahead, gonna yeah, keep yeah, it back in 2014 I was working for Gen Op and we hosted uh, an event a, a happy hour for for like conservative young millennials that's like our thing it was like we were Gen Y before Gen Z before Gen <laughs> Z was a thing and um I, I hosted an event start at seven o'clock but at six o'clock we we shut down the bar the restaurant we're, we're, we're opening we're getting things ready for the event and Rick Perry knocks on the door with his staff and he's like potentially the next president of the United States. This is like the big governor. Everyone's excited about him. And I pop my head out and I say, give me a second. And I talked to the maitre d' and said, maitre d', I will cover their charge. If they want to pay whatever, they can sit in the back corner and they can like eat while we're get setting up. So they do it. Tell Ray Perry and his team, they all come in. The Texas Rangers are there with them. They have this big squad. They're all hanging out. And I come back to him 15, 20 minutes later. And I said, Hey, I got you a space to eat dinner. You would have had to wait in line somewhere else for an hour or whatever. Here's the deal. You have to come by my party and say hi to all my friends. And the funny thing was he said, he said, yes, I'll do it. And, uh, and so at seven 30, we were doing our VIP session for like young conservatives, like in a partnership with red alert politics and their 30 under 30 project. And so it's all these like young aspiring conservatives. And I had Justin Amash speaking to this group. And Justin's giving the speech about liberty and doing the most Justin Amash, Hayekian, you know, Bastiat, blah, blah, blah. As Justin does. As Justin does. God bless him. <laughs> All of a sudden, I see the door swing open to our little event and in waltzes, Rick Perry interjects and like pushes Justin out of the way. Who's this young whippersnapper? And he like stands and he's like, like kind of like in a karate stance. And he's like, I'm Rick Perry. It's great to see all of you. And I'm just like, this is the greatest thing ever. I, I, I tap Justin on the shoulder. Are you cool with this? He's like, oh, this is amazing. This is incredible. <laughs> and Rick Perry risks for like five minutes about liberty, about limited government, about why it's great that these young guys are interested in, in CPAC and conservatism. <clears throat> and then he just like left. He just, he just walked out. And then Justin like didn't know whether that he should talk about, you know, like how great Edward Snowden is or not. I don't know what he talked about, but like, we then moved on with, with our evening. That's and for perfect. me, like, that's the cool thing is that if yeah. you're a young activist, these are your rock stars. These guys on Fox news or people you see on C-SPAN, if you're that type of dork who's into it, which apparently we are like, it's a cool way to like, you know, in, engage with those people who otherwise you never would get to see or, or no, get to see. no, I mean that you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, like I think some of my memories from the 2011 CPAC are Jimmy McMillan randomly coming up to the, the, to blogger, to the, the bloggers row and hang like hanging out and interviewing people. Andrew Breitbart stopped by. I randomly met Richard Dreyfus while walking around. <laughs> around the sea. I'm serious <laughs> while walking around CPAC like he was just he was he was by himself he was just out there hanging out this you know this actor who who you know Mr. Holland's Opus and some of these other uh you know famous movies I remember the movie Jaws, I, you know, Jaws. I remember from what about Bob that was my first yes, introduction yes. to Richard Dreyfus when I was a kid um I had no idea who he was other than that other than those few movies but you know I mean like you know, we, that's where I met Gary Johnson for the first time and hung out right. with him. Got to know him a little bit. A year later, I'd be driving him around Georgia when he was running for the Libertarian Party nomination for president. You know, I mean, it's, and I, that, you know, that, that parlayed into me driving him around for three days, just around the state of Georgia, just to speak at different events. And, you know, it's, it's, it's cool because you, you, 
you get, I will say this for CPAC, you do get access, you get to see your friends and people you don't get to see that often. You get to hang out with them for a few days, you part, you hopefully see them next year. If you don't, you'll see them in a couple of years, but you get access to people you may not ordinarily see and get right. access to. And right. that is something that's really cool about CPAC. But in our conversation about uh, telling a story, I wanted to parlay into our next uh, our next topic because this one is one I used to used to write about a fair bit, but I haven't written about it in a while, so I've probably forgotten all the details of how it used to work. But I remember when I was growing up, hearing Neil Bortz, who was a talk show host in Metro Atlanta, talk about the fairness doctrine, mm -hmm. and certainly it seems like it's making a comeback. At least it could be making a comeback. Uh, your boy, y Andrew Yang, I know is, uh, is, by the way, my new office is right next to the American Mathematical Society. So oh, every, wow. time, every time I walk next to it, every time I walk, get off the elevator, it's right there. And uh, it's literally the suite next to us. And I always think of Andrew Yang because of his, his, damn, yes. uh, his damn lapel pin that says math and his hat that says math. But uh, but the Fairness Doctrine was was a pretty, uh, a pretty onerous uh, uh, policy that was around as recently as what the early eighties mm -hmm. required, mm -hmm. required radio stations broadcast to give equal time to opposing sides of an issue. Uh, and it certainly seems like it could be making a comeback. And I know Nathan with your, from your time at the FCC, uh, in addition to just being someone who believes in the first amendment and the freedom and freedom of association, this is potentially a problematic policy. Yeah. No, if anyone who hears me rant on, on line, whether in clubhouse or on Twitter, you'll hear me talk about the problems of the fairness doctrine as, as, especially as it applies to media. And, and it was a really problematic law that really hindered, uh, uh, uh journalistic integrity and journalistic independence, um, and forced people to have both sides of issues. And it really kind of foster this both sideism. It's not about, um, enabling, uh, 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 accuracy. It's about both sides. And I don't know how you do both sides for QAnon. I don't know how you do both sides for birtherism. I don't know how you do both sides for all these other kind of crazy things that are out there. And that's, I think, one of the problems about these, these individuals don't think about when it comes to fairness doctrine. It's not accuracy. It's about giving both sides. So does Marjorie Taylor Greene get the same perspective as someone who has different views of her? And, and then and then are you actually enabling them to have more time because of these equal time rules? And so I think when guys like Andrew Yang, who I, I got to vent for a second, like when the guys like Andrew Yang talk about it, they I think they're missing the point. Also, Andrew Yang is his entire existence is because of alternative media. I freaking love Andrew Yang, or I have a love-hate relationship with him because he came about in the 2020 uh, Democratic uh, 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 primary, and I was fascinated by like the fact that he was talking about issues in a different way, and he kind of came across different, and he seemed like someone I could ha go to the bar with and have a conversation with. Even if I would disagree with him, I could totally see his side, and so I was very excited for his candidacy, especially among so many other Democrats who have the same viewpoints, and I like that he was challenging questions. I think, you know, um, universal basic income is a fascinating idea that can be debated and Discuss on both the left and the right, right, things like that. I was all into that. But whenever he steps into these issues without realizing the ramifications of what he's saying, the only reason he exists is because of podcasting. Podcasting, yeah. there are no fairness doctrine rules. We can talk about whatever crazy stuff that we want to talk about because we chose to. That's Joe right. Rogan can do that. Um, Joshua Harris, um, uh, 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 Camille Foster, um, Eric Weinstein, all these guys can do that. And that's because there aren't the same broadcast rules. There aren't the same cable requirements. There aren't the same other serious XM uh, 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 rules and, and, and regs and, and cultural policies. It's you talking about what you think is important to your audience, whether that's five people, including your mom, thanks, Terry, or if it's thousands or millions of people, and you build a brand based on that. So the idea that you want to have a fairness doctrine to like police what others can or can't say, I mean, come on, man. Yeah. And I think this is my problem with a guy like, like Andrew. I love him. I, lo I love what he stands for. I think he's a good father. I think he seems like a good, good husband. He seems like an interesting policy person. I I'm glad he's in the debate. I'm glad he's running for New York City mayor. But when you say things like this, it makes someone like me really frustrated because it's like you're speaking out both sides of your mouth and you don't even realize it. And you're also undermining the reason I liked you in the first place. And that's just like it's a, it's a real shame. And I, and, I, and I think guys like that should be careful trying to get clickbait because that's what that was. That was to win a soundbite in a Democratic primary or to get attention after January 6th. It's not a realistic idea. And for someone who's about real ideas, that's just a bad idea. That's just a bad, bad start. No, it, it is a bad idea. And it's, it, it's the, the thing that it, it's 
if I recall correctly, like the way the way boards used to frame it was Democrats needed this because conservatives were outpacing them on talk radio because you mm-hmm. had you had Rush Limbaugh in the 90s. You had so you had Rush Limbaugh. You had you had rest the, in the, peace. The rest in peace. You had the emergence of Sean Hannity. You had uh, Gle- Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck. Uh, and, and the left could not because remember, they started Air America mm-hmm. <clears throat> during the Bush, the first Bush administration, well, not the first Bush administration, but uh, Bush 43 in 2001, 2002, something like that. Uh, to combat like you know Bush's you know neoconservative leanings, they were pushing back on with an anti-war agenda, among other things, the the social conservative issues that that Bush used to push, and it failed. It failed miserably. And um, it's conserv- uh, liberal talk radio or progressive talk radio has always failed, with the exception of like Tom Hartman, who. You know, he, it's, he, that's not done well either. He's on Russia TV. I don't even know if he's on I was, that anymore. I was going to say, you know, who, who did so well that he ended up on RT, you know, right. which is not exactly where you want to be. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's it, it just hasn't worked because there's not much of an audience for it. MSNBC has done well, and they're right. going to do well over the next four years because you're in a Biden administration. The left is empowered because of, you know, because of Donald Trump's exit. And they, they think they have a mandate to govern, which they really don't. But that's neither here nor there. But uh, it, of course, it's going to do well, but you still have Fox News. Fox News now has competition with Newsmax and OAN, uh, and then CNN still out there, and they, you know, their ratings have been ticking upward at least last time I looked. So, I don't think I think Americans have plenty of alternatives to go get their news. Right? Uh, they don't necessarily need uh, they don't necessarily need a fairness doctrine because there's so many places to get it. And look, cons- there 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 is a branch of progressive and conservative who are not going to. They're not going to pay attention to those outlets anyway. They're going to go get their news from conservative treehouse or wherever the case may be, and it's not. It's going to be fact free anyway. Uh, a conservative treehouse or or, or chopo trap tra- house or whatever it is. So I, I think this is all on the heels of a hearing last week and a letter from several Democrats um, who were calling for um, basically bring back the fairness doctrine, regulating cable c- cable news, encouraging cable carriers to cut. Fox News, OAN, Newsmax. I think we talked about this last week. We did. We did. The real thing that I want to go back to this, and I just want to hit it again, is that by driving out perspectives you don't like, even though it's inconvenient truths in some ways, you are then delegitimizing your own credibility because people don't want to trust you. And so by they're not going to start watching CNN. The conservatives aren't going to start tr- listening to MSNBC. They're going to go elsewhere and it's going to get more crazy i think andrew yang should be aware of that i mean the fact is yang gangers met him through alternative media they met him through alternative outlets and you know they're not going to go back to cnn or msnbc also they're not going to hear andrew yang if we have a fairness doctrine there's no no one on the other side of some of these issues from him so they're not going to they're not going to allow him on there so yeah I, I, I will say that now on a different note on talking about actually good journalism, we don't get to talk about good journalism every day, but I really want to chat yep. about fair, good journalism for once. There's an article that dropped um, this week uh, in Bloomberg called sneakerheads have turned Jordans and Yeezys into a bona fide asset class. And it is kind of falling on the same narrative about wall street bets and certain like kind of redditors who have turned up, you know, upended the, the, the wall street uh, 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 marketplace and, you know, shorting businesses and kind of going to war with the, the, the private equity firms and all that stuff. Um, this in the same way is kind of happening. You have a bunch of uh, online uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Joe Herbert is the one that Hebrew, is the one that they focus on, who have basically uh, just made a killing in the resale market for for hard to find shoes, whether they're Air Jordans, whether they're Adidas, whether it's Yeezys, whether it's like, you know, old Chuck Taylors, whatever it is. And they are basically buying up all these limited supply shoes and then reselling them on their own websites at a huge markup. Hmm. And everyone's been doing this for decades i mean you have variations of this you know you go into a footlocker buy a bunch of shoes and you try to sell them online you did this with ebay people try this but they've basically gotten this to a science where they're selling like two hundred thousand dollars worth of shoes at a time and they're making like 10 15 30 40 percent markups it's it's pretty pretty incredible it's obviously a, a market deficiency that they've taken advantage of, and they're actually, you know, sharing. Uh, they're 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 making money off it. Also, the funny thing is they're going to mom and pop shops that aren't selling because of COVID or for whatever reason, and they're buying them up. So these people now get sales, which is great, and then selling them to people online. But the fascinating thing was Joe Hebert, who was interviewed in this Bloomberg story, was evidently using his mom's credit card 
The fascinating thing about his mom is that she is a senior vice president at Nike. So this guy was shorting, you know, Nike and buying all their stuff, then selling it at a huge markup, but also doing it on his mom's credit card. And now there's questions about whether he had access to friends and family's discounts. Did he have promos that were only available to her, et cetera? Apparently, in an investigation, her name is Ann Hebert. She, two years ago, disclosed this to Nike that her son was starting a resale company. Makes you wonder how much she knew about it. Um, yeah. But then uh, when, when, the, when the journalist looked at some of the statements about his financials, said, who's this Ann Hebert on here? And he said, oh, it's my mom. And then the reporter's like, what's your mom do? And then he, he did, I don't want to talk about it. The reporter did good journalism, found this out. Ann has stepped down last night, stepped down over this. She's no longer at Nike. And it's actually kind of kickstarting this really interesting conversation about resale, whether it's it's a good thing, whether it's a bad thing, whether it's a story in the market, um, whether it's legal, whether he was doing this illegally by, uh, you know, inappropriately having access to, to proprietary information, was his mom uh, being faithful in her fiduciary responsibilities. All these kind of fascinating tripped up from this one article. I had, I had, I had known shoes were popular, but I had no idea the, the the amount of money that you can make in this space. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's because it, I see this happen. I mean, this happened like PlayStation Five, for example. I remember, or I, or I remember yes. when when PlayStation Three came out, people were buying up as uh, you know PlayStation Threes and then selling them online for like triple what they were actually retail price of them, what they were selling for at Best Buy, for example. You know, you, you, the PlayStation Three, and you know, I can't remember when they came out, but like we'll say two thousand seven. Uh, they were selling for like $400, $500, and people were selling them online for like $1,500, $2,000. Um, there's, as someone who who rec recently has gotten into vinyl records, I mean, I, I've had some since I was probably 20, but I recently started buying them like they were going out of style again. Um, so, uh, but like there, there's, there's company, there are companies that are doing short-term limited pressings of records I kind of grew up on and would like to get, they're selling out fast and you're finding them on eBay for a hundred dollars when they were going for about 25. And it's, it's, so it's kind of frustrating in that way. Cause you want the record and people are buying them to go sell them and, and make money off of them. So I, I don't have a, I don't have a problem with it. It's inconvenient for me because I have to spend triple the amount I would have spent, but you know, it's, it's kind of how things work. The questions that this poses though, with considering his mom worked for Nike and whether she might have, well, she did know about it. The extent to which she was involved, obviously is an open question. That's where the ethical concerns kind of get me because I really yes. don't know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, if there is, if there's going to be litigation against her or anything like that, that's a really interesting question. And we'll find out a lot of that stuff during discovery. Right. <laughs> you know, but she was, he was putting 10, 20, $30,000 on her cart. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> he's a dropout he's a dropout from i think oregon and obviously because everyone out there is from oregon um and he was like like 21 22 right out of college and he just started this you know started you know selling a couple at a time apparently they use discord to to recruit other kids to help facilitate this they all will go online at the same time buy up as many as many of these limited supplies as they can they will drive around they showed this video of this of this these images of them of him and his team driving a a u-haul across the country picking up thousands of shoes from all these different stores now here's the funny he thing. had smurfs he had smurfs instead of getting pseudoephedrine they were getting shoes it's incredible it is incredible and the fascinating thing for me is and I, again from a market question and, and legality I, I don't know all of this but i think it's fascinating that someone could say oh this short changed a lot of people but actually all these stores sold the shoes that they were going to sell in fact a lot of the people got access to these shoes yes at a markup but they also got access to the shoes because otherwise these companies nike adidas others are artificially limiting the supply because they're going to do a small lottery so a right. few people are going to get um a couple of shoes not a lot of people are going to get access to these shoes and it's actually kind of like redistributing these shoes through the market forces to people who actually want them who are willing to pay 200 yeah, 300 dollars right. for these shoes they want to well that's the question you have to ask yourself is where's the harm right where where, right. where where is the harm where is the harm to person or pro uh, person or property or you know like where where was someone harmed in the transact and during these transactions when you can show me harm given the the ethical concerns of the the mother's situation aside 
right second but show me the show me the actual harm that was caused if you can show me harm then i'll start to listen to you but until you can show me harm i don't really care and i think that's i think that's exactly right i think you're i've already saw it online i saw clubhouse room talking about i saw people on twitter talking about oh this is terrible all these kids (laughs) i see it the opposite i'm like you know whether it's wall street bets whether it's whether it's this whether it's some of the entrepreneurship we've seen coming out of um out of the pandemic there are there is a class of particularly young entrepreneurial men and women who are in the Gen Z millennial class who are thinking very creatively about market market shortages and how they can play that in a way that benefits others and benefits themselves and actually changes the, the rules of the game. And I think that's kind of neat. I like this concept of, you know, the underdog fighting yeah. back and trying to see how they can play the game to go against those uh, who, who have established themselves in the marketplace. And I, th- I think that's a radical thing. And I think we should try to see that in more things, not less. No, I agree with you. Well, Nathan, that's uh, we're pretty much out of time for, for this week. Uh, uh, sorry to end it. Go ahead. What shoe is your favorite shoe? I, w- I wear Vans, dude. Like You're a Vans guy? <laughs> I wear, I'm a Vans guy. I, it, uh, I've been a Vans guy for a long time. Um, uh, I used to wear Chuck Taylors, but I stopped wearing Chucks because they fell apart too easily. Vans last longer. It's a skateboard shoe. I I, I wear I rock my Adidas uh, 2.0 mids, the hoop basketball <laughs> shoe that are like high top, all whites. They're beautiful, absolutely so, gorgeous. I also have a pair. Also, speaking of skateboard shoes, I also have a pair of Etnies at home, which is a another skateboard shoe that uh, I found. I saw this pair of Etnies. They got dirty really fast, and I haven't really worn them as much. I'm gonna buy another pair that's maybe a little bit different. But I I really like my Vans. It would take a lot to get for me to get rid of my Vans. I'm actually gonna buy a red pair of Vans soon because all i have is black right now but uh mix it up yeah mix it up a little bit but uh that's all the time we have for this week uh we will be back next week i will be back in in uh metro atlanta next week with my my actual setup at home uh and uh if you like what you you heard please go to exile policy you can watch the youtube video there uh, or you can go to check us out on soundcloud or or you can uh download the, the podcast on itunes we'll have a link on exile policy where you can go and download it uh, f- uh but Have a good rest of your week and we'll see you next week. Nathan, see you, buddy. Talk to you later.